Trade Association in Northern Pennsylvania, Northern America. And I'll bet all of you didn't know that. I didn't know that. You didn't know that? No. They had no idea. Uh, Audrey Rousseau facilitates strong interaction with all sectors of the regional economy. <coughs> she believes only to succeed and grow through technology innovation and commercialized disruptions across every platform and experience. You have to work at it. <laughs> you, you really have to work at it. She's committed to the complexity of Pittsburgh's physical, literal, uh, terrain, believes that vital cities are the whole imperative in, in achieving competitive, diverse, and vibrant economies. She's also active and probably overextended like most of us uh, in serving our community. She serves on the board of the World Affairs Council. She was the chair of the World Affairs Council. She's on the board of the Jewish Community Center, Greater Pittsburgh, for Greater Pittsburgh, the City Lab, Highmark, Business Advisory Board, Urban Lake of Pittsburgh, City Asylum, International Women's Forum, which R. isn't R. on here, but I but I added it. R. Um, RIDC. Uh, and she co-hosts, and many of you hopefully have heard, Tech Vibe Radio on KDKA, 1020 AM. She's on Friday nights at 7. So if you're out and you've done happy hour and you're on your way home at 7, you put it on 1020 AM and you'll get Audrey. Um, but she's here to tell us about what she's involved in. And she and I have made a pledge to work closer together. So this is for, for your benefit as much as ours to try and strengthen the partnership. Please join me in welcoming Audrey Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yeah. Good. Because I walk around. So, um, listen, I'm no busier than most of you. So, thank you for the intro. But, oh, I know the one thing I forgot to tell you. I asked her for one word to describe herself direct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just because I'm so busy. I don't have time to, to traverse any small talk. A lot of people criticize me for that. But anyway, good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for getting up early on a Friday. Hopefully, I will keep you entertained, and I will keep you aware of what's happening here, OK? So I, I have to tell you that I moved to Pittsburgh just a little bit. I moved to Pittsburgh in 2001. And I came because I was running information technology for a company called Reynolds Metals. And we were acquired by Alcoa. And Alcoa created um, a great job for me. I ran um, global uh, Oracle implementation, which was their ERP across 48 countries. And um, my focus was on the human resource management systems. So I don't, I'm not an HR person, but I know enough now spent five years understanding processes across every continent and almost every country. So I know enough about HR um, to tell you that I would never be great at HR. Um, but I can tell you that I understand and I've learned a lot about people and uh, being a global citizen. And one of the things that after I left Alcoa and worked at Maya Design, um, I said to myself, it's really important. And I came to the Tech Council said, we have to be global citizens. And one of the things, the things about Pittsburgh that I noticed was that very often Pittsburgh tends collectively to sort of look at itself, just at itself and not necessarily being a citizen of the world. And being a citizen of the world means a lot of the things that we wrestle with today, which includes words that I think are often overused because they're misapplied, is inclusion and diversity. So for me, what really matters is creating a place where people can prosper and people can build their ideas and people can make a difference. So as a result, I've been in this job for a decade. It freaks me out thinking about that. I don't know where my life went. But I can tell you that I spend most of my time 
helping people build their ideas. That's really my sport. And what I like to tell people is it keeps me off the street because I can be busy helping people and uh, opening up doors and creating pathways. And there really isn't anyone or any idea that's too crazy because I can tell you stories about ideas that have been built. And today you might laugh about it, but they're pretty big companies and they're doing some incredible things. And there are many, many ideas that are incredible and never see it to fruition. And that's just sort of the world that I live in. And today I have Gina Winstead with me. She's on my team. And uh, you know, we just do some really incredible things, but we're not the be all and end all. So I wanna tell you a little bit about the Tech Council. I wanna tell you a little bit about the work, and then I wanna open it up for some questions. So to hear from all of you about what your perceptions are, what are some things that Doris and I can do better that maybe we should work on, that maybe we should think about, um, or maybe we should not do. Um, but that's sort of how I, I want to let this conversation you know, go. The Tech Council, um, and by the way, this little thing right here I thought was um, little mints, and Clinton kept telling me stop pressing it. Uh, those aren't mints, Audrey. Okay. Okay, I got it. So here's a little bit about our story. Why do we exist? This is a very basic, why do we exist? The Tech Council was started 35 and a half years ago. It was started by a bunch of guys and a bunch of white guys who actually came out of Carnegie Mellon. They came out of advanced manufacturing. There were a couple of people who came out of a law firm, Buchanan Ingersoll. Uh, it wasn't called Rooney at that point. And um, then a couple of other people who were building some ideas back you know, in like Murraysville and you know, some random areas and they used to get together and say, what could we do to not let this region still be known as hell with the lid blown off? What are we gonna do? Because we think that we have assets here. We think that there are things here that we can coalesce. We don't wanna become a chamber, but we wanna do a lot of what a chamber does, which includes public policy, which includes forming a PAC, which also included us starting a venture fund. So all these guys put their money together and put their resources together and started what they call the CEO Venture Fund. It was part of the Tech Council. So at the same time, they realized that there were, um, in Boston, were working on the same thing. So they got together, the folks from Boston and Pittsburgh, and said, what are you doing? What am I doing? What are you thinking about, et cetera? And we were the first Tech Council of Boston came almost right at the same time. So why that's important is, is that a bunch of, all of these people said, we need to coalesce. We can't do what the Allegheny Conference does because they're looking at sort of the big picture. They're looking at clean air, they're looking at developing all these other sectors, but we are going to do something that's gonna focus on, and by the way, we were called the Pittsburgh High Tech Council. We were not called the Pittsburgh <coughs> Tech Council. And actually, so we're not high anymore. Um, <laughs> not until they legalize marijuana. <laughs> so, but the funny thing is, is if you do a Google search, you do a Google search and you do the Pittsburgh High Tech Council, up comes us still. And to this day, the SEO is still optimized in terms of the high tech. So it's pretty funny. But I gotta tell you that when I took over the organization, we were a big organization then. We had almost 90 people. I had four nonprofits um, that all rolled up into the Tech Council, and it's a, it's a very common phenomena in this kind of nonprofit, non-charitable world that organizations start to, you know, gain moss. You know, they just roll, and different things happen, and get scope free. So when I came, took the organizations apart, and I took the Tech Council back to its original mission. And here's what is original mission, and it's exactly what I'm doing today. It is to ensure that southwestern Pennsylvania is a place for all people who want to build tech companies and innovation, that this be the best place that they do it. 
so to accelerate their growth. That is exactly what we want to do, and that is exactly the mission that these guys had back in 1982. So we have a few priorities, and I want, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about them so you can understand. We do a lot of things. I like to say we're a 35-year-old startup. We're nimble, we're lean, and we're, we, can, we can pivot in a weekend. If we want to build a new program and we think we want to slay something, we can do it in a weekend. We just sort of you know, get together, figure it out. We're very, very flat. We figure out how to do things very quickly. And the reason why I like that is because I want my team to know what it's like to be one of our members and one of our customers. It is so important because when I first came, the people that were on my team had no clue about what our members were going through and what were the issues around innovation and building companies. Now my people know. Everyone understands our profit and loss. Everyone understands what we do with our money. Everyone has a financial target because those targets are based on value. And so that has allowed my team to become very, very sensitive to the issues that are pervasive in the business world. So we have, these are our priorities and they're not in any weighted order. They're not in any, but these are the things that we do. Sometimes they're high priority based on what's going on. So the first that I put up here is public policy. We're very active in public policy, but sometimes we're active at different times. We don't run races, we support incumbents. We have a small pack, um, but we, we really focus on a few things. And the things that make sure that southwestern Pennsylvania is an incredible place for people to build their businesses, to work, and to live. Number one at the federal level right now is immigration reform. That is our number one issue at the federal level. Why does that matter to us? Because H-1Bs and people who are here that are trying to work and building companies and doing postdoctoral work and even master's work want to build their companies here. They want to. And on top of that, the last time this data was collected, 52% of those tech companies that are on the NASDAQ, that doesn't even mean the ones that are successful, were started by immigrants. So we have to be really conscious that we cannot leave the world out in our strategy. So as everyone knows, this is not something that's going to be solved overnight. We've been working on, on this uh, even during the Obama administration. Very, very, um, very tough. And if you are from countries like India, the waiting list is like 100 years to be able to come here and, and plant your flag. These are serious issues that affect us. We educate people here from all over the world. They get to, to study with the best and brightest, and they get to be next to people who are building incredible intellectual property, and we send them home. And it is a problem. So uh, on the state level, we really are just trying to support um, Keystone Innovation Zones. Um, actually, Gina is our point person for the Greater Oakland Keystone innovation zone to make sure that we have, you know, that small companies can get the, the um, incentives, the little incentives, they're not really big in the state of Pennsylvania, but the little incentives, we work to make sure that um, organizations like RIDC are actually thriving and getting what they need in terms of building capacity for the future. So anything that drives the capability of people to come to Pittsburgh to make sure that this is an amazing place, that's what we do. So the second thing is talent. So we work on, when I say talent, is talent is a problem everywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world. In our space, the problem around software engineers, people who have expertise in machine learning, people who, under, who have competencies in uh, natural language processing, robots, sensors, those skills are very, very hard to find. And those skills don't just always come out of Carnegie Mellon, and we can't all sort of tag on to the talent that's coming out of Carnegie Mellon for a couple of reasons. We're leaving a lot of people behind. Not everyone gets to go to Carnegie Mellon. And there are other ways to do these kinds of skill development. I mean, even Dr. Bullock and I have talked about what is going on at CCAC and what are some of those initiatives to make sure. Because the competencies that can come out of that school are high paying jobs, huge amount of opportunity, and you don't need to be able to go to a school like Carnegie Mellon. And listen, I have a great relationship with Carnegie Mellon, but you know, Farnham and I talk about this a lot, and it's like, yeah, we, we can't do that stuff, and we shouldn't be doing that stuff, 
And we need those kinds of people to help with the proliferation of innovation that's happening. So I'm a huge proponent for all new ways of educating people so they can be part of this economy. We are involved in as much as we can to sort of help that, to understand from policy, but also to help share that so that everyone can, we can have these conversations so that you know, not everyone needs to go even go to college. Right? There are other strategies. And uh, so we work on those issues of talent. Sometimes we work with specific companies and we help them try to identify specific skill sets that they're, that they're missing. And we are suffering just like they are in Silicon Valley. We are suffering just like they are. It's just a numbers game. They have more people, you know, they have a little bit more opportunity. But if you look at it and you normalize the data, we're all experiencing the same kind of problem. The third thing is, um, Doris mentioned that I do a radio show. Uh, that's part of our strategy to make sure that people in southwestern Pennsylvania know what's going on here. So we try to dissect and break it down into little snippets so that people can understand all the companies that are in this region and what they're doing. We do radio now. It's downloadable in podcasts. It's, it, can, it can go to three or four states. Our job is to make sure that the world knows about what's happening in Pittsburgh. We're no longer just focusing on Pittsburgh knowing what's happening in Pittsburgh. Our job is to tell the world. And we do that. Uh, I see Gina put out magazines. This is our, our recent, is this our recent magazine that you put out? So we have that. Believe it or not, these magazines are very, very um, important. They have a long shelf life. We have it online. There, you know, we do everything that we can. But we tell stories. And, we want, and, and telling stories means really capturing the essence of what people are doing in bite-sized ways so that people can understand kinds of activities that are happening here. So um, everything we do in visibility, you know, from websites to social media to doing video in our new space, we're going to um, build a podcast. We have a podcast room in there so we can do impromptu interviews, push that out on top of what we do with radio. And uh, then we also do some video work. And any chance that we can to be on television and tell our story, we do that as well. Um, the, the next thing we do is business development. For our members, we really work on business development. Why? What matters and what, how we measure our success is when our customers are successful. And what does that mean? Getting capital, getting strategic partners, beta testing their products, getting relationships with corporations, not just from Pittsburgh, from around the world. We just had Johnson & Johnson in, the, the head of global procurement, for um, diversity, she came in and she met with our members, and uh, many of them have an opportunity to start to work with Johnson & Johnson. That never would have happened because they have no presence on this side of the state. We work on that all the time, looking constantly for those, you know, we worked, we took a, a whole bunch of people to John Deere to, to work with their procurement people. We actually got a couple of the robot companies to get you know, a little beta testing with John Deere, now they have a strategic partnership. That's what we do. And uh, we try to, to make sure that there's enough investment as well. And what does investment look like? 70% of the money that comes into Pittsburgh to invest in technology and innovation companies comes from outside of Pittsburgh. While Pittsburgh historically has an incredible amount of wealth, it is not a place where money is readily invested into innovation and technology. It is not. What we're starting to see, though, are those, or those companies that build stuff, like things that you can see and touch. More of Pittsburghers can appreciate that. And I just say it's like in their DNA, right? They got to see it. They got to feel it. They got to watch it down the line. They, got, you know, they feel like they can add value there. And, and historically, that's where our capabilities have been, so it's not a surprise. But I can tell you, some of the new companies that come in town, when they get coverage and they say, oh, you know, so-and-so, Aptiv is growing, and Petrum is growing, and Aurora is growing, the stories that are told about them are really about the brick and mortar. They're taking out 10,000 square feet. They're taking out 20,000 square feet. It's never about the problem that they're solving. 
So it's a, again, it's sort of in our DNA. So I try to tell writers, can we write about the problems that they're solving? <laughs> okay, let's not talk about the 10,000 square feet they're taking out in Lawrenceville. But we have this sort of in our DNA here that it's around the stuff we see and the, you know, what they're building, et cetera. It's okay to talk about that, but how about talking about the fact that they're working on sensors and saving lives and, you know, autonomy and giving people of all kinds access to point to point transportation. Um, and then we also sell insurance. We, we started years ago, we sell insurance, that um, all kinds of insurance. We used to have, before the Affordable Care Act, probably the best insurance plan. But since the Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act, and now even recently, um, Trump has uh, instituted a, the uh, association health plans. We thought we were going to be able to do that and have some good you know, opportunities for members to buy insurance. We still do, do sell insurance, but unfortunately, the state of Pennsylvania, the um, head of the insurance commission has said no one will be able to sell for, um, association health plans in Pennsylvania. Um, they want to keep the Affordable Care Act. They don't want to give small businesses an incentive to get better, better um, pricing and better plans. They want to keep that intact. And um, I think that is Governor Wolf's objective to make sure that, th that these association health plans do not come here. So no one, even if there's plans that are in other states that are, that are selling those plans at good rates, so like Aetna's and Cigna's and all those people, they will not be able to sell in the state of Pennsylvania. So I'm a little irked by that and I try to do some lobbying around it, but I don't see the change. So unfortunately, healthcare costs in Pennsylvania are high. They're gonna go up again. And uh, the ways that I used to be able to help small businesses it's uh, it's gone up three percent. They're talking about it going down three percent. Yeah. Well, but we'll see. We'll see. You want to bet? <laughs> <laughs> right. So the point is, is that you know, these, we our job is to make sure it's a great place for people to build their companies. And if health insurance uh, costs are skyrocketed, it's really a problem. It's a problem for business owners. It's, it's a problem for um, employees. I also have an organization called 40 by 80. That's the Longitude and Latitude of Pittsburgh. And uh, it's a nonprofit, and it's, it's a wholly owned nonprofit of the Tech Council. I started it to focus on those areas that, we, that are charitable there, and also allows us to take money from foundations if they're interested in any of our work. And lastly is development of strategic partnerships. So like I'm, the reason I'm here today, and the reason Doris and I have talked is like, what can we do together? What can we do to accelerate more inclusiveness and more um, greater paths for people who don't necessarily represent the whole tech economy? The tech you know, economy has suffered a lot around um, gender parity, around um, you know, women in particular not necessarily being part of, of their technology ecosystem, African Americans not being representative of building new companies, and you can't tell me that any of those groups aren't just as smart if they had enough access and enough support to build their companies, particularly in tech and innovation. So that's something I'm not proud of in 10 years that I wouldn't say that we've gotten better. And uh, you know, I'm I'm wishing that we could get better. So I, you know, I'm very open to feedback and ideas and strategies that will take us to, I'm very, when, when Doris said I'm direct, I'm very act, action oriented. I want an outcome. I want to see the move, you know, the needle change. That's what matters to me. I don't want to have a lot of conversations. It's fun to have conversations, but I want to create some meaningful outcomes. So we have strategic partnerships. We work with a lot of the corporations. We work, for example, right now, we're running something with the Penguins. I'm very close with them in terms of um, innovation and technology. We're having tech days at the Penguins, um, you know, a few of the Penguins games. We're always figuring out ways to get technology into the Penguins. We're very active with them and uh, they're very interested and supportive of those kind of collaborations. There are, I could tell you, at least three to five companies that have actually soared as a result of our initial relationship with the Penguins and without them taking any equity or financial investment, just leveraging their capabilities of exposure. 
So <coughs> let me, this is small to read, but I want to I want to give you some points, some some bullets. How am I doing on time, Doris? How am I doing on time? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, a couple of things. In 2017, unfortunately, data is lagging, so just bear with me. So this is the most current data, but I'm going to talk through some of these points. Pittsburgh has, has a flat, if not declining, population in the metro area. Okay. I understand that we're on the map, we're the best place to get a job, we're the best place to, to live, and it's amazing, and you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I like that exposure, that's all well and fine. But if you look at that USA Today, that was out this week, was it out this week, Gina? The USA Today said that we're like the number one place for jobs. Did you look at the jobs? Warehouse jobs? None of financial <laughs> advising. Right. I mean, so the, we, so we get negative unemployment because of the We do. That's part of the reason we have negative unemployment, right? But it's not in terms of the number of jobs per capita. You follow me? The number of jobs per capita and the <coughs> gaps are in those other domains. So, to tell you the truth, I don't really want the world to know that those are our top three needs. Um, I get it, we need warehouse folks, we need people who can move from point to point, but it's not necessarily um, putting us on the map. Nashville has more demand for software engineers than we do. And just to compare us to like a city like Nashville, Nashville's growing at 92 people a day. Now I'm not saying I want Pittsburgh to grow at 92 people a day, but Nashville's growing at 92 people a day. What's our growth, Audrey? Our growth is negative right now. At the metro area, it's negative. At the CSA, which is sort of the, what's that, the commuting distance um, that goes, I don't know, I'm looking at you because you know this data. Uh, yeah, it's it's broader than the, the metro area is the seven counties. The and seven counties, yeah, right. And then the CSA would be the, even bigger. It's called commuting distance. Mm -hmm. It's like you could live in, like, <laughs> we're, we're in Ohio or whatever. Right, you could live in Weirton, right. Um, but we are down. I mean, we're down, I don't know, down 0.2% maybe, <clears throat> but, it's, but it's down. So, so meaning, what does that mean in terms, I think last year our net negative was like uh, 8,000? Does that sound right? Yes. I don't know the exact figure, but it's been, it's, we're losing people. We're right. Losing. At the broader Right. Rate. So right. we're losing people. But here's the fascinating thing. The number of people who are between the ages of 25 and 34 who are moving here, yes. and they are moving here, so we are having that, but we still have a net negative, are the highest educated in um, the top 15 benchmark regions. So the, they have the most post-master's degrees. That, that's why you're seeing that kind of explosion in Lawrenceville, hmm. right? Because that's where, where it begins. It's the same thing with parts of East Liberty. So, you know, that is what's happening. Now, there are some people who are saying, well, you're having a lot of people who have lived a long time and now the aging are passing away. But they're passing away at a rate that's faster than those that are coming in. And those that are coming in between the ages of 25 and 34 are waiting longer <coughs> to have children and are waiting longer and, and are not necessarily having more than 1.5 or, you know, whatever that number is. So you take that, and, and that's sort of what's happening. Um, the question, the, the point on this is that we went from 1970 in Pittsburgh, this is the powerful thing. We went from 1970 to a near perfect employment where people didn't need to have anything past 10th grade education and had great jobs. And now we have high education attainment level, high wage earners, right, and th in that, in that range between 25 and 34, whereas before it used to be between 16 and 25. And so the shift is what you see in terms of these pockets of areas where people are really growing, okay? But they're dense pockets. They're dense pockets. They're dense pockets with a lot of disparity in between. So um, I, I mentioned about um, demand for software engineers. There's also a huge demand for experienced executives, people who have experience taking companies from nothing and growing them. And we don't have a lot of that because most of those executives went and moved somewhere else. 
So we don't have a well of experienced executives, and that, that's almost in every domain. So the more these companies can come here and start and have an exit and then start again, that's what creates our capability. So we work on that at the Tech Council, trying to find those people that really can help these companies rise. Because if you're a founder of a company, you may not be that person who's gonna take the company to the next level. So very often, it's gonna be someone else. You can still be a founder, you might be a product designer, or you might lead a piece of the company, but you're not the same person that's gonna take it and soar, that's very rare. That's rare even in Silicon Valley. So um, another thing is that the metro area represents 24% uh, of all people who are working are working in tech-based companies. That's as many people as, that's the same percentage as people who were working in the steel mill back in the day. 33% of the region's payroll are people who work in the tech. So the shift that you have is the higher wage earners are working in these fields and they have power and influence and they want nice restaurants and they want nice amenities and they want, you know, point-to-point -point transportation and they want great travel. So they're driving and shaping our economy in ways that we really need to understand and we need to make sure that we're not displacing the rest of our economy and not bringing up the total ecosystem because tech is still very fragile. It's very fragile. People can leave in a heartbeat. They can shut things down. Facebook, Google, the economy can change. We're outposts for many of these companies. Even though they planted a flag here, we're still outposts. If you're sitting in Silicon Valley and you're looking at your numbers, and you may say, yeah, what's the big deal? I can shut that office down in Pittsburgh. Big deal if I have a 10-year lease. I can, I can you know, wipe that out in no time. So anyway, the important piece for me and for our organization is to make sure that the story is richer. The story is much more richer. Um, the number of IT companies, I want to point out real pure IT companies, like companies that do data centers and managed services, et cetera, has remained flat. And that's remained flat all across the United States. Why? Because automation. You don't need as many people sitting in a data center. You don't need people sitting on the phones doing help desk because you have artificial intelligence and voice recognition and natural language processing and it can accelerate that. That's the benefit of automation. But IT has been remained flat. When I was in a data center, you know, there would be like 50 of us. Today there's like three. It's similar to the steel mill. You know, it's just been automated. You just have a couple of people doing, you know, process control. So that's the good part, right? But the bad part is where are those people building those skills for the next for the next iteration? I'm just trying to paint a picture for you so you can understand the ecosystem. Um, the highest growth is in robotics. And for the first time, I moved here in 2001 and people told me that this was RoboVerb. In 2001, this was not RoboVerb. This was research RoboVerb. There were a lot of people doing some interesting things that were over at um, NRAC, which is over in Lawrenceville, and they were doing incredible things, but it wasn't coming to the market. Now we are finally seeing robots come into the marketplace. And there are a list of incredible companies that are doing amazing things. And it's easy to find, and if you want to know who they are, reach out to Gina and I. We can certainly give you the list of people who are putting things into motion in the market, in customer's hands. Uh, a month ago, how long has it been? A month ago we were at Sheets. We brought Sheets over, it's a month ago. We brought Sheets, the leadership, executives of Sheets. They're, you know, the family and like their top 20 people. We had a chance to spend two days with them and we took them over to Carnegie Mellon and they, we met with a researcher that's doing work on satiation, actual food satiation, understanding when people are full, eating, et cetera, sensors, that was mind blowing. Um, the second that we met with was a woman who's working on socialization of robots so that we can be prepared that my colleague is gonna be a robot and learning innuendos and psychological patterns. And we were, it's pretty close. 
it's pretty close to being a part of the world. We sat at Sheets with the Sheets leadership and said, can you imagine, like, you know, one of the, one of the people at the register also has a partner there and there's a robot and is picking up on your movement and is picking up on your pattern so that you can actually have an interaction with the robot. So this is non-industrial robots. And she's pretty awesome. And I would tell you in five years, we're gonna see some of that. So really cool stuff going on. Some people might find it scary. I can tell you it's happening. Whether we're scared or not, it's happening. Um, we also had a drop in energy technology, which is probably no surprise because of everything that's happened with oil and gas and the changes in the industry. We had a big jump in energy and tech, and now we're, we're seeing it flatten out. Uh, I think if we grow again in that space, we'll see a little bit of an uptick, but probably not the same as we did you know, right at the onset of, of some of this exploration. Um, the research in biotech in this region is in one of the top five in the nation. We get the most uh, money from NSF and NIH over at the University of Pitt in particular, but the commercialization at the University of Pitt has been very slow. It's been very slow, and a lot of those reasons are is that we don't have big pharma here, really. We don't have what New Jersey and Philadelphia have. Philadelphia <coughs> is probably the third or fourth hotbed in the United States for life sciences. But the good news is that Chancellor Gallagher is really working on trying to figure this out and put some money behind it, opened up something called LifeX, which is over on the south side, um, near Southside Works, and they are building capacity on investing in these bios and life sciences. Because the work that's being done and the problems that are being solved at Pitt are just incredible. And if we could see some of that work come to fruition, you know, we might once again be the place where polio was, was cured. It's, it's right here. We just haven't gotten it out in, you know, into the world yet. Um, I talked about most of these things. CMU continues to be a bright spot, I said, but you know what? There's a company called Gecko Robotics that's over in North Point Breeze, and um, they just raised seven million dollars, and he comes out of Grove City College, and he has created a robot that weighs 40 pounds, that sort of looks like a square with claws on it, and it climbs and checks out um, power plants. It goes to places where none of us would ever have gone to look at infrastructure issues, cracks, leaks, data, and uh, he laughs because he says, you know, I'm over here in North Point Breeze, I Grove City grad, and all these CMU kids want to come and work for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that story. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of those things. So how do we do it? So how do we do it at the Tech Council? How do we do all this stuff? I just want to tell you a few things. We do events. Similar to the Chamber, we do events. We do breakfast. We do uh, events that are uh, chief information officers, chief marketing officers. What we do is we try to get people in front of decision makers that they couldn't get in front of. So that's our strategy. We do that at events to make sure that people connect and people connect to get business. That, that is really our focus. We do a lot of storytelling. I mentioned about business development. We do things like supplier forums. I mentioned earlier an example of that with J&J. We've done that even with companies like LabTech. Uh, we've done it with, you know, you know, UPMC, on and on. We've done those kinds of things. The intention is for them to get business. We also have um, a women's leadership program called EDGE that is focused on mid-career women who are in tech. And uh, we focus, we do like a nine-month cohort that is really focused on trying to help them break the, the barriers inside the organizations that they work in or to figure out where they want to go. And it's been a really great program that is modeled on, um, on collaboration, door opening, and um, competency building. We do a lot of speaking engagements and a lot of people on my team are out there telling stories and they're actually out there working to make sure that we understand what's happening because we can't just get this information through data. Um, we're a 35 year old startup. A little bit more about us. We do a lot of things. We have websites, we do social media. Anyone who works on my, my team can tell you I probably overwork them. But I want, again, as I mentioned earlier, I want them to know what it's like for the rest of you. 
because if they don't know that, they can't provide value. I, try, I hope I gave you an overview. I hope you get a sense of what we do. I deeply care about this work. Um, you probably can sense that by just my passion. It's pretty authentic. I am very lucky and honored to be a steward and serve in this space. And I'm thrilled that Doris asked me to come this morning. So thank you for your time. I can take any questions if you want, but appreciate it. Okay. Any questions? I just want to make one comment as you go along. I'm here. We're not competing. No. We don't compete with not at all. I've had people ask that. We're a chamber of commerce. We have a tech council. They have to offer certain services to their membership as we're a full service chamber and we offer benefits to ours. So I just want to make sure. Thank you. I'm sorry. If that yeah. Came yeah. Off. No, no, people have just asked that. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, a question. Oh, yeah. Actually, I, um, going back to your first couple of points, I had a couple of observations I was wondering if you could comment on. Um, number one is, you know, the things going on in Pittsburgh with robotics and sensors and all that is fascinating. But what I see is, for those of us who are in old economy industries, I see a complete lack of computer skills that support the functions that we do. How to set up and distribute a contact, right. do a mail merge, those basic things that we used to consider basic mm -hmm. skills right. are exceptionally hard to find right. now. Um, the other thing is, you know, we used to talk about the digital divide, which is now turned into the Grand Canyon totally. because I see a complete population in this city that has zero computer yep. skills mm -hmm. I agree. and makes them very difficult to employ. Right. So I don't know if you could address those two things. Well, no, I mean, that that's something that most recently Dr. Bullock and I talk about because it's really the opportunity for this upskilling, right, and this basic... It's, it's scary to think that to come out of high school and not have those skills, but I know that that exists. Because if you don't have access to the tools, there's no way that you're gonna understand that. And, um, and I agree with you, you know, and I would add another thing, writing and critical thinking skills. Absolutely, we talked about that yesterday. <laughs> I mean, that Absolutely. is just huge. It's like problem solving and critical, because that's what you need today. The more sophisticated automation is, the more you need people with those kind of advanced skills. And you're right, the schools, you know, I can't really speak to the schools. I mean, I only do so much in my world. But when I see problems like that, I try to seek out partners and say, what can we do? And I can tell you that even big corporations who might have people who worked in data centers or are working on old technology like Fortran and COBOL, they need to upskill their people. And you and I just talked about that. We talked about how do you take even those corporations that have people and how do you upskill them and what's offered to them so that it's a meaningful upskilling. But you know, the question is on that one, Darsh, and you might know, um, are there programs and incentives at the state level or through workforce that can help small businesses? so that they can that's one of the get things that's tool. coming out through the deputy secretary of commerce now um, uh, he's doing a disparity study and this is part of what he's rolling out so are there like the incentives state. like it would be great for small I don't know businesses about incentives i don't know about the incentives but they're talking about programs or programs or programs i mean to me that would be small businesses are the heart of america and Pittsburgh is rated one of the top cities for small businesses, for the longevity of small businesses. I think we're like, I want to say we're in like the top five of, of companies under the size of 50. The Kaufman Institute has a report on that. So if you want to Google it, you can see it. But to me, small businesses are the ones that need those kinds of programs. So uh, did you have another question? We have time. One more. One more. Okay. Thank you, Audrey. I had, I had a question. Uh, so we, you touched on this a little bit. We often hear about how there's all this innovation coming out. Not a lot of it gets commercialized. Right. The ones that do don't really grow to a critical mass to hire a lot of people. What's what's going on there? Why why is that happening? Well, there's a lot of reasons. One is that when you know 
the innovation that comes out of universities has to have a structure to it. That means that the universities have to have a strategy. In CMU, they have a policy of take five and go, take 5% and go. They've made it a little easier over the years, and sometimes they can take 7% with residuals. The University of Pitt is working through that model now. The University of Pitt has more life science companies than Carnegie Mellon does, so they're a little trickier because you know they have to go through a lot of regulatory stuff and there's research that's tied to it. But I'm confident that that um, Chancellor is working through that at the University of Pitt. The second thing is, is why they die is because we don't have enough executive leadership to make it so that they know how to open up their Rolodex, open up those contacts, take the company to scale, deal with the kinds of things that many small businesses are masters of. They know how to take it through that. So we're missing that sort of decades of skill set because we didn't have that here. So they die, they, we call it the valley of death. They get right up to here, they get a little bit of traction, and then in order to scale, they, don't, they, don't, they can't take it to the next level and then they, then they crash. And it's more complicated, I don't want to make it seem so right. simple, but it's definitely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> about Audrey, she can go for a while. Um, <laughs> but it's all relevant information that you need to know about. And as we get our base together on um, constructing a program, we'll keep you informed because we want you to come out. We will do it in the form probably of a workshop through the Business Institute. But you need to be a part of that. Um, but thank you. That, that, that was excellent. Let me share a few things with you and say thank you for a couple things. Those that attended the Urban Pathways K-5 um, Charter School Mixer, thank you for coming. You learned a lot. We learned a lot. It was really nice. Very well done. And um, the children are learning there. They're definitely learning there. I want to say thank you to all who attended our 20th anniversary uh, reception. It was probably one of the nicest things we Like you can't imagine being with the Tech Council that long. This was supposed to have been five years and out for me. Um, but I want to thank all of you who attended. It really was nice, thanks to our chairman. Quentin Bullock, Dr. Bullock gave testimonials on our Junior Chamber of Commerce. Chauncey talked about his corporate experience and what has happened with um, his role on the foundation board. Carol Felt talked about her company and what it has meant for her. And I just want to say thank you publicly to all of you. It really was very nice. Um, and we had fun. We, we, we had a good time with that. We've got some new members um, that are here, but before I introduce them, let me just um, make note of one thing that just happened. The National Minority Supplier Diversity Council had their national conference in Texas, right? Austin. Austin. Austin yeah, Austin, Texas. And EQT, <laughs> Uh, was named one of the top suppliers in the country. Um, Lance Hyde and Blue Jenkins accepted on behalf of EQT. So, congratulations. That was really nice. Some new members that I think you'll find noteworthy uh, Jerome and John Bettis. Bettis Brothers Sand and Gravel has joined the chamber. We've got 10 new members from the Bridgeway Capital Program. Um, Jim said, did I say it right? You did. Yeah. Said, okay. Yeah. Uh, Cornerstone residents, welcome. And Scott Taylor, Loving Kindness Healthcare System are our new members that we had since our last meeting. Don't forget this month, we've got a members mixer on the 30th. It's held at Highmark, and the host is trying together. It's a new associate member. They are trying to help pull it together here in Western Pennsylvania and break down some of the diversity issues. And I think it might be 
you'll find it enjoyable. Just come, bring some business cards. If you can't stay, stay for an hour until you exhaust all the business cards that you have, and then you can go home. But you'll learn something from just being exposed to this group. It's getting cold in here. Um, and we're moving. Yeah. <laughs> like the, yeah. And you, the don't, you, don't, you, don't, yeah. you know what this the, is? The yeah. room is the vibrating. It is. Oh, it is. Okay. I know. It's <laughs> there. <laughs> it's there. It's there. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. Well, the building the is. Okay. The building. okay. That's the That's the okay. Okay. <laughs> Don't forget, so um, next month we have two events we want to make you aware of. Petra Mitchell, our member with Catalyst Connection, she's doing a manufacturing supply chain workshop. Beneficial to all of you, whether you're in manufacturing or not, on November 13th. Supply chain applies to all the work that we do. Um, my sister kind of got me better exposed to supply chain than to understand the movement. This is something I think all of you will benefit from attending. Catherine Kelman is back on the chart with us November 14th. She will be our speaker. She's the CEO for the Port Authority. She will be our speaker. And you have to make sure you read your email. Let me say this again. You will have to make sure that you read your email. You must read your email because our November uh, seasonal celebration will not be mailed. You'll get your invitation by email. You're probably saying why. We're, we're starting to work on saving trees. But the reason is we're going to have it at one of our new members place, Sugar and Smoke in Bloomfield. The room is absolutely fabulous, but it doesn't hold hundreds of people. So it's first come, first serve to the members. So let me repeat one more time. Please read your email starting in the first week of November. We'll send you a nice invitation and we encourage you to come out. Um, she'd love to see you. It is probably one of the nicest new started restaurants in that area, right across the Bloomfield Bridge. Yeah, it's really good. Food's good. Have a good time. And then don't forget December 6th is our annual business luncheon. We are having Leroy Ball, the president of the building where we are housed. The Coppers Building will be our guest speaker. We have the Roland School of Business and EQT are serving as the sponsors for our, um, our luncheon, and we encourage all of you to come out. You're going to hear a recap, some things about what happened at our 10th anniversary, but Leroy Ball's gonna tell us about what his company does. I apologize for it being so cold, but I'm freezing. <laughs> I mean, it's normally warm in here, but it's cold, and I will let them know. Thank you so much for coming out being here with us today. I hope you learned some things, Audrey. Thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate it. Have a good weekend.